All right. Well, I think we should have everyone here so we can go ahead and get started. Hello, everybody, and welcome to Setting Up a Virtual Office, Tips and Tools for Extended Remote Working. My name is Danielle Padula. I head up community development at Scholastica, and I'll be moderating today's webinar. We really appreciate everybody joining us today. We know everybody has lots going on right now. Scholastica, ISMTE, and Research Square wanted to come together um, to organize this webinar to really provide a forum to share remote working tips from our organizations and for you all to ask and answer questions. We know that everyone is making a lot of adjustments right now in light of COVID-19. We hope to help you make the transition to remote work more easily and also to prepare for the potential of longer term remote working in these uncertain times, since I know we all aren't quite sure of timelines right now. Today's webinar will be a panel style discussion followed by a live Q&A with the speakers. You're welcome to submit questions at any point during the webinar using the Zoom Q&A panel on your screen. You should see a little Q&A icon in the middle bottom of your screen. There's also a chat bubble if you prefer, so either of those options. As a reminder, we'll also be making the full recording of this webinar available after the event via YouTube, and you'll also get an email from Zoom with the link to that recording, so you will have access to the webinar afterwards. So to get started, I wanted to quickly overview the agenda. We're going to be focusing on three main areas of remote working, how to set up a personal remote workspace, and our speakers will be speaking to working in different um, situations, since I know many are home with um, children or spouses, so I, I know everybody has kind of a different remote, remote working situation right now. Um, we'll talk about using digital tools to facilitate live team communication, both planned meetings and those impromptu discussions and also how to foster a remote office environment, by which we mean both a work culture and also team culture and community well apart. Um, and we're very grateful to the following speakers for joining us today. We have Jody Harrell, Marketing Manager at Research Square, who's part of a semi-remote team there, so they do always have some remote employees. Brian Cody, co-founder and CEO of Scholastica, and we also have a semi-remote team. Jennifer Mahar, Senior Managing Editor at Origin Editorial, and Jennifer is fully remote. Um, and I'm actually going to have each of the speakers quickly introduce themselves now so they can provide us with some more context about their current remote working situations, since I know we are all in different circumstances right now, as I mentioned. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and stop sharing my screen now. Um, and I, we can have maybe Jody start with intros and then Jen and then Brian. Okay, great. Hey everyone, um, my name is Jody Harrell. I'm a marketing manager at Research Square where I've worked for about five years. Um, Research Square is a remote first company. And what that means is um, we have an office that's headquartered in Durham, North Carolina, but the, um, the vast majority of the people that work at Research Square are remote. Um, the kind of the bread and butter of our business is academic editors and they're given the, the freedom to work um, wherever they like. Um, and then depending on the team that you work on, you might go into the office um, more or less frequently. So for me, my team meets about once a week in an office. And so before coronavirus, I was going in um, on Wednesdays and that's when we have kind of that face-to-face -face time. Um, and now obviously I'm working uh, fully remote at 100%. Uh, my spouse is also home with me, which is different. Um, and then I have a three-year-old daughter who's been with us for about the last two weeks. Um, so those are, those are uh, that's very different. I'll also say that I am in North Carolina and in North Carolina we have a stay-at-home order and um, what that looks like for us is my husband goes out once a week for groceries. Um, you know we, we um, go hiking or try to get outside in the, in the, during, sometime during the day and, and on the weekends and then otherwise we're all stuck at home with each other. So the challenges that I'm dealing with are, are having uh, my spouse at home and my kid at home um, and it's just kind of managing distractions throughout the workday. Um, Jen, you wanna go next? Sure, it's my turn. So my name is Jennifer Marr and I'm an executive peer review manager with Origin Editorial and I'm a newly elected board member at ISMTE. So I'm happy to come to you from that capacity also. Um, I live in Pembroke, Massachusetts, which is about 20 miles south of Boston, two towns north of Plymouth, Massachusetts. And uh, I've been contracting with Origin Editorial for um, eight years now, uh, since 2012. It was, 
I was surprised to see that um, when I looked back to check the number. I've been in peer review management um, since 1995. <clears throat> I think I have the silver pin, so 25 years. Uh, I've, I've always felt that I'm part of something bigger though, which has always been the great part about what we do. Um, that's the drive that keeps me going every day, even here at home. And I've been at home with Origin Editorial for the last eight years. Um, but I have always worked from home in some capacity in every single position that I've had in working for a journal. In my first, uh, in my first, very first journal that I worked for, I wrote into my contract that I could be home at least one day. Um, at that time, that was that was unfounded. It was unheard of. Um, but I was able to prove to them that what I was doing at home was important and it was focused. And I did something different uh, when I was home on many of those days, did reporting, I did deep dives into different things. And so that was, um, that was how I proved my value to be able to be at home. Um, I'm currently at home with my two kids. I have a teenager and an 11 year old. I have two dogs a cat, and my husband just took FMLA, which I'm thrilled about because he's able to um, care for my children. They're starting distance learning on Monday. I'm here in Massachusetts, and we also are in a stay-at-home advisory. Uh, we have been delayed for school until May 4th. Um, I'm not sure about that, as you all probably aren't either. I am doubtful that they will go back to school, but at least they're starting distance learning officially on Monday. Um, and the way that that's going to look is it's just going to be a pass or fail grade for them for the rest of the year. Um, I feel lucky that my daughter is actually a junior and, and not a senior this year. Um, since starting with Origin, my teams have always worked remotely. Uh, we have a very large team running about 19 journals with about 30,000 submissions per year. Great. Uh, I'm Brian. I'm one of the co-founders and CEO of Scholastica. Um, oh, and people who don't know, Scholastica, it's a modular set of software tools for academic journals. So we have a peer review solution, um, OA journal website hosting, and then a typesetting and article production tool. So that's for making the PDF and XML. Uh, so when we started Scholastica, I was, well, we were all working remote um, because we were working out of our, you know, houses at night. Uh, but as we actually got going, uh, I was, um, my wife, who at that point was girlfriend, worked um, out of state, so I was out of state, and so we actually started hiring people while I was remote. And then the whole time we've been doing this, everyone works remotely essentially at least two days a week, um, and we've had people who are full-time remote, like Danielle, uh, for years. And so we, uh, it's been sort of part of our culture, and I think software development tends to be a lot, um, there tends to be a lot more of that. Uh, people work very different hours. Some of the developers, like I'm an early bird, so I tend to work like 5 a.m. into the afternoon. Some of our developers start around 11 a.m. and ship code at crazy hours. Um, so, you know, that, that's part of it, but I'll, I'll echo um, before we're talking about this. Um, Jen said something, which I'm trying to, I'm going to try and channel throughout this is we're, we're going to be talking about working remotely not in normal fashion, but during a pandemic. Um, and I think that is very different. So for me right now, I'm used to working from home, but right now uh, my wife is a hospital administrator in the hospitals. She's involved with you know, trying to help organize a lot of the response. And so she's, she's here at the house, but not really. So I'm, I'm taking lead on childcare with our two and a half year old. So that's long days trying to find balances. So I'll try and work some of those. Uh, I don't even know if they're tips yet, but uh, working strategies right now uh, as we talk today. All right. Well, thank you all. And uh, yeah, as Brian mentioned too, just quickly, I'm also fully remote um, and remote here by myself. So for those of you out there who um, don't have kids and spouses, I also understand. And we we feel for you if you're uh, kind of just alone in the situation as well. Certainly lots of different circumstances. Um, so I, we want to uh, get right into the discussion here. We have some planned panel questions, and then um, we'll also be taking questions from you all out there. So again, please go ahead and submit those questions via the Q&A um, icon as, you, um, as you're ready. We'll be able to save those all and get to them at the end. Um, so to start, I wanted to ask everybody what advice you have for setting up an extended remote working space at home, um, and again, particularly 
within these new remote working circumstances when maybe it's not entirely feasible to set up, you know, a full fantastic desk or whatever your ideal situation might be? What, what are your tips for having that extended remote workspace and making it work um, at these times? Um, and for that, I think, uh, Jody, if we could start with you. Yeah, I was just gonna, um, I was just gonna start by saying, you know, ideally we would all have an office that had a door that we could close when we had phone calls or meetings. Um, and that's certainly not what I have going on right now. I, I work out of my living room. Um, and, and to be fair, I was working out of my living room before coronavirus. Um, it just happens to be kind of the space in our house where we have the best um, setup for my desk, but I don't have an office and I've never had an office. Um, and that's been, that's been fine for me, but now I'm working with, um, with my daughter in the living room who, where, you know, that's where all the, her toys are and that's where the TV is and that's where all the puzzles and games are. Um, and so, you know, setting up a, setting up a, a, a remote work environment during this time doesn't have to look a certain way. Um, one of the things that we did almost immediately once we found out that my husband was going to be home is that we went ahead and got him set up in a spare bedroom with a desk and with a, a really nice ergonomical office chair so that he could be comfortable. Um, and so that's one thing that I would recommend is, is, is if you're not used to working from home um, and, and, you know, and it's easy to say, oh, you know, I don't know how long this is going to be. I'll just get set up at the kitchen table. But um, it's not really comfortable. And so we went on Wayfair and got a $56 desk and, you know, he's very comfortable. Um, and so one um, ideal is, is not going to happen right now and that's okay. Um, and I think another thing when I think of the word space is um, for me as part of my work environment is also kind of setting up structure um, and boundaries around the workday um, to kind of help me be more successful. And so what that means for me is we have a schedule, more or less a schedule that we try to stick to every day. And I think that's really important when you have little people in the house. Um, and that kind of helps me set up um, some sort of a work environment so that at the end of the day, I fully close my laptop, I push the chair in, and that's kind of my equivalent of shutting the door. Um, so if you are working out of kind of a communal space, um, just recognize that it can be really challenging um, to have that visual reminder in a common area like the family room that you're used to maybe relaxing with your family or something like that. Now you have this visual reminder of work and all of that, you know, all of that that, that might mean from the day. So whether you're working in a really difficult role or you're, you're during a period of high stress with your job, just recognize that, that, um, that that's possible as well. Um, I've, I've, um, I've gotten used to it, I would say, um, but it's definitely something, it's definitely an adjustment. Anybody else want to jump in with other tips on setting up a remote workspace? I think what, what Jody mentioned is, is all those things are important. And for me, it was about, it was simply about my computer. So I have a very small laptop that I literally carry with me everywhere because I work remotely all the time and I happen to have a daughter who ice skates. And so being at the rink is part of my life. And so bringing my laptop with me, um, the same laptop that I use when I'm sitting here at my desk, that's what grounds me. It's my tiny little Surface Pro that I love. And when I open it up, I can instantly work. It doesn't matter where I am. It, it, it's about putting that in your mind and setting that space in your mind of saying, okay, I'm, I'm now at work. Um, I'm lucky, I have space here on my porch, I can close my door. Um, so I, I'm kind of ahead of the game in, in many things, but what it's important for you is to wrap your head around the fact that you now are saving your entire commute. Um, and guess what? You don't have to, you don't have to work until five. Um, you can work whenever you want. You're saving all that time of getting ready. I felt pretty good. I got ready today. So I was excited to, um, you know, brush my hair out and put a nice shirt on. And But I do that most days, to be honest. Um, I, this is, again, as Brian said, this is not just remote working. This is remote working during a pandemic, which looks very different um, because you need to be there for your family. You may be needing to care for someone who isn't feeling well. 
Um, so those things are important too. But what we've learned from our teams is that people can work at any time. I'm not a night person, but I have people that work. Um, they just don't start work until 5 p.m. and they work until midnight. And that's perfectly fine if that works for you. But having a routine, getting up at the same time, just like you would have, um, getting your kids going at the same time, and whenever you work, making sure that you try and do that at the same time. Those are things that I found that really, really work for me. Um, you might think that some of that is not attainable, but after you do it for a while, what is it they say? You have to do something for a certain period of time before it becomes routine. So that's the same thing. You need to make sure that you have um, all your tools that you need. We all have good headphones. Um, and just as Jody mentioned, you can order it up if you don't have it. I know that non-essential items are not necessarily on the top of Amazon's list, but they will come. Um, you will receive them at your home. I've ordered a couple of things um, that have come and that's not been a problem. So making sure that you have the good camera, put that camera on. Um, that's something that I think that people are not doing right now. Even still, they're a little tentative about putting that camera on. Put it on. We need to connect with each other. And I, I think there's some really good strategies there. So I'll try and be more tactical. Um, one is seconding what um, Jennifer said. I think investing now, that's something I've been talking to all of my colleagues about is, yeah, the question of well, how long will this be? And it's like, if, if your desk is hurting your back, I mean, I'm sort of thinking the end of April, I'm in Chicago, uh, feels optimistic. End of May feels more real, realistic. Um, it's a, you know, what is it? It's a foggy crystal ball. Um, and so, but that's sort of how I'm thinking about it. So I'm thinking if there's something that's gonna make a difference, if you get it in three weeks, that'll still give you probably a while to get benefit. Um, so that that's one, um, even things, you know, small things like, oh, you don't really, you know, you feel like you would do better with a mouse, go ahead and get it now. I mean, it's those things that can make a small difference. One for me is, um, I was mentioning this you know, sort of before uh, the this started when panels were chatting, but my two and a half year old really likes to slam the laptop shut. And I think it becomes a symbol of my distraction. And so one thing is, you know, I, and I'll kind of trust two things. One is I have an iPad because he doesn't have that symbolic association and I can do lots of things like calls with people, uh, listen in on webinars, um, answer emails, and um, it doesn't have quite the same effect. And, and related to one of the, I think one of the questions that came in, one thing I'm trying to do sort of with that is also realize him fighting with me is gonna lead to me not being productive and he's gonna need even more attention. And so I'm trying to have those breaks where I say to my team, I'm taking 30 minutes and then totally focus on him and sort of get some energy out and help him move into a period of independent play and then I can switch back often to the iPad. Um, so that's one. Uh, so very tactical upload speed. So a lot of people will do their speed test and look at their download and I really encourage you to look at your upload. If it's less than five and I really think 10 megabytes, you're gonna have probably have trouble video chatting with people. And so that's just, that's something to like keep in mind. Um, and then, and that, that can lead to a, a frustration when you're dealing with people that you don't have in the office. So that's looking at upload speed, restarting your router and laptop frequently. Um, I've started just doing it in the morning because I get up early before anyone else is up. And um, I know it's sort of like changing the oil in your car. No one wants to clear their cache on their computer or restart it because you have to close all your tabs down. Just do it. Um, it'll, it'll lead to things being a little faster and smoother. Um, and then back to schedules, I, I try to look at my own productivity and realize um, you know, with my, my child, but then also me, when am I most productive? So I, I've been doing a five to eight um, a.m. And that's when I'm getting all my project work done and then having all my calls and emails later in the day. And, and that's working out well. And, and I think like um, Jennifer was saying, if I try and work in the evening, I'm, I'm brain dead. And it's just, it, it's not the same quality work. Um, so just figuring out that schedule that's gonna work for you um, and then sticking to it. Um, and then also, sleep and exercise, do everything, but that's trying to balance that, you know, keep sleep. So don't, I would love to start at 4 a.m., but then I'll just be, I'll get sick. So uh, those are some of my thoughts. Sure. And I think definitely I will echo the exercise. I think that remembering to move is so important. I find that if you just even do a few jumping jacks, it sounds silly, but that mental clarity, it can sometimes kind of reset your brain. Um, so now moving into some more specifics, 
what um, what digital tools does everybody recommend for facilitating team communication and also project management? I think with working remotely, those are sort of two things that can seem challenging at first is communicating with people, both in terms of having those meetings, but also being able to just say, hey, you know, what do you think about this idea? Um, and then also being able to keep track of projects when everybody is dispersed. Um, so for that, um, Jen, do you want to start? Oh, sure. Um, so I'm probably old school in my tools um, in the sense that I, we, we set up a certain way to do this quite some years ago in terms of our teams and it's worked well. So it's been one of those if it's not, if it's not broken, but we use Skype um, primarily to communicate. We don't use it necessarily so that we can see each other. We have running dialogues with each other because our journals are so, so large. We never want to step on each other's toes. So on one of our journals, which is really large, 8,000 submissions a year, um, they're calling out the, the manuscripts that they're working on in the initial QC or when the papers are coming in the door and they're, and they're having a running dialogue in their, in their little micro team. So Skype has always been a very, very important tool that we've used. And of course it's free. Um, and being a contractor, these are very important things to me because I, I don't have benefits. I don't have certain things that come along with my job. So I want to try and get as much as I can out of, out of the internet that, that doesn't have to come out of my pocket so much. So it's helpful to be able to have that tool in order to talk with everybody. We can talk visually that way also, and we've been doing it more because I push everybody to do it. Uh, we still have our meetings. We still have weekly meetings. Um, we have newsletters where we share information about work and then not about work too. I want to see everybody's kids. I want to see their dogs. I want to see their families. Um, one tool that's really important for this time is reporting. And that may seem, um, seem like a normal thing, but you've got to document what happened during this particular time. You've got to say, this is when this started for me. And that, might, that may alter what your reporting looks like during this time. So moving forward, you want to see what kind of an effect or an effect that had on, on this time frame. Um, and, and again, that, that whole thought process of making a schedule, that's a tool. So you literally go into your Outlook calendar and you schedule yourself to have time to do certain things at certain times. Because otherwise your day gets away from you. You're checking the, the COVID map. You're, you're worrying about what's going on with your family. So anything that you can do to try and schedule your day to say, here's my time to do this. Um, any meeting is what we use in order to talk with larger groups. I don't think that Zoom will allow you more than a 40 minute meeting um, in term, for the free option. But of course you can always purchase into that. So those are some of the things that we use um, in order to, to have tools going on. And the, other, the, the last thing that I would wanna mention that I think is important is don't forget the basics of what you do at your, at your regular job. So things like GDPR are still important. Um, if you're using a home computer, be very careful about your security. Be very important, exactly what Brian said, clear your cache out, clear your temp files. Um, you don't want any of that to go by the wayside while, while you're working from home. Um, Brian, do you want to add some, I know we have lots of tools that we use. Sure. Too. Yeah. Um, so we use Slack for our <clears throat> internal communication. And one thing I really like about that is it has video chat built in. So it's very easy to go from um, typing and especially like a sort of rule of thumb I use is if you've had three back and forths, especially quickly in chat, to me, that's a signal that talking uh, live, I was gonna say in real life, but it's not, but speaking face to face is going to end up being more efficient versus trying to clarify um, period. Uh, and I think especially with extended remote, it's a nice, for me, a nice heuristic to say, well, this is also a chance to chat, uh, you know, with people because, you know, you don't get as much of that. Um, one other thing that they have in, in that that I really like is you can screen share right from the same app. And what's great, especially if we're doing something creative or if we're trying to uh, workshop something, you know, being able to show not tell is great. You know, if you're in the office, someone can say, you know, looking at this and they're pointing at their screen and that's really hard to do on this. And so, I mean, Zoom, people use screen share, which I think is great. Um, the Slack ability to then draw on their screen and say, this is the line I have a question about is really helpful. So, so we use that very frequently. Um, sort of related, one thing we've been discussing in the office is um, making sure to sort of actively use 
alert when you're going to be away. So if you're in the chat room, because you know, imagine the office, if I went up to someone and said, hey, I have a question, and they just stared straight ahead, it would you know, be so frustrating. And if you're used to chatting with someone and them answering and suddenly they're not, and you feel blocked, that's very frustrating. So trying to have, like we have a, a channel where people can just say, oh, you know, going on a break or leaving or use your status. Um, and that's again a little bit of the human side, but trying to sort of set um, an explicit expectation for people that this is our norm. If you're unresponsive, realize that that's you know, sort, of, sort of encouraging empathy. That's going to have people you know feel frustrated and blocked. Um, so we also use a lot of Google Docs, um, shared docs, uh, which is nice. Within that, um, all of our calendar in invites create Google Hangouts automatically. So we tend to use those um, for chatting um, and for project management for years we've used Trello, GitHub. Um, one thing that we use to tie all this together, if people aren't familiar, if, if you've ever seen me on a webinar, I've probably mentioned this, uh, Zapier, Z-A-P-I-E-R. So it's a tool to automate things without having to be a programmer. So you can have a Google Sheet and if you add a row, it could send an email or add a calendar invite or uh, add a card to Trello or almost any tool you, you use it can have sort of, it's like a if then then that idea, but it, it tends to be very powerful with apps. So we get all sorts of alerts in Slack. If something happens or a kind of email comes into our support box, we can get special alerts. There's just a ton you can do with it. And for remote teams, um, part of what ends up being harder remotely, I think sometimes is copy and pasting stuff to tell someone that, you know, it can just be uh, cumbersome. So if you can automate that, that's useful. So I'll stop there. Uh, Jody. Yeah, so I can definitely echo using Google Docs um, a lot. Just the whole Google suite has been really helpful. Um, we also use Google Hangouts. The only caveat there is I think there's a, a limit to the number of people that can join a call. Um, I, I can't remember what it is, but just check into that. Um, one of the things that I use personally, I think we've talked about a lot of different um, tools. We also use Slack at Research Square, um, kind of as a replacement for email, really. Um, but one of the things that I use is um, project plans a lot. So if I'm working on a certain project, uh, I have a project plan and what I do as part of filling out the different tasks or my kind of my schedule and the different um, things that I need to get accomplished and when and what depends on what task depends on what, um, I link to all of those documents within from within the project plan. So once I fill out the project plan and I have all the links that are, that are um, all the documents linked in there, I share that with my colleagues. And so it also takes the burden off, off me to have to answer questions that they may have when I'm not online. Um, I also work with a, a very um, widely distributed team. So we ha I have colleagues in China that I work with on a regular basis, um, the West Coast, Spain, London. Um, I've had a, um, a manager that I reported to in the, in the UK. And so a lot of this, a lot of times we're doing stuff at, at very different times. So a project plan is a way to to have everything together in one place um, and to also have kind of a, a level of transparency with your colleagues of, of this is what I'm working on and that sort of thing. Um, the other tool that I use um, that I've started fine tuning as I've as we're as we're working um, remotely for an extended period of time is having a the reason I say that is because the the number of I'm still working throughout the same number of hours over the day, um, but kind of focused work time is a lot less. Um, and so what I do is I wake up, I'm kind of an early bird, like like Brian mentioned, but um, I wake up and from seven to eight thirty, that's like my dedicated heads down time. Um, and my family can't talk to me. Um, literally, that might sound cruel, but if you have kids, you know that it's really not. Um, and so from 7 to 8.30, and I have a, a to-do list that's a digital document, right? It's a Google Doc that I pull up at 7 o'clock, um, and I rank it in terms of importance. So um, the, the things that I have to get done that day are, are, on the are, are one and two. Um, and I also, from within that doc, that document serves as kind of a master document for me. I link out to all of the things that I'm doing. So, so much of my work is project based. I'm working on, I don't know, eight or 10 different projects at the same time. Everything is linked within that document. And that is, that is, that is what guides me in the morning when I wake up. Um, and I don't have to like think about where I am. I know exactly what 
my priorities are that given day and I know exactly what needs to get done. Those things are highlighted. The things that need to get done that week, they're highlighted in yellow. Um, and I also cross them out and I leave them there as kind of a sense of accomplishment of like, these are the things that I did today. Um, the other tool that we use and, and we've always used is um, within my core team are stand-up meetings. So some of you might be familiar with stand-up meetings and, and everybody does them slightly differently, but um, we sign on at 1030 every morning and we use, we, we take about 15 minutes um, among like eight or nine people and we say the most impactful thing that I did yesterday was X. Um, I plan to work on Y today and that's it. That's your, it, it takes all of a minute to do. Um, and then we all go around the room and that just kind of helps us stay on the same page. And if you're depending on somebody for a project, you can kind of sync up with them. Oh, I need to talk to you about that. Let's, can you stay on the call with me? That sort of thing. Um, so those are all tools that, that I use um, to help me get through the day. That's great, really helpful. We also do team standups at Scholastica and find those to be really helpful. And I would emphasize too, um, you know, we're a very de developer based company. I remember coming to Scholastica and learning a lot about different developer concepts that I didn't know. Standups kind of started as a developer concept, but it really works in any kind of a job capacity, I think, and, and it's so helpful. So I would say if you've thought of that as kind of a foreign concept, it, it can be applied to other types of teams. Um, and with that, I think this kind of nicely segues into the next question. We've talked about tools. Jody has kind of started to talk about processes. Are there any other uh, specific remote working processes or methodologies that you've all found particularly helpful at this time, either personally or in terms of managing a team? Um, Brian, I'll throw that to you first. Sure. Um, so, you yeah, know, starting with the plus one on stand up, uh, we call it Scrum, um, but that, that idea of checking in, there's some accountability, some sort of planning, so you think about your day in chunks. Um, but for us, a really important time is, so again, we call it Scrum, post-Scrum. One of the main things we say is, you know, what are blockers, and right after that, that's a time a lot of people are gonna work together to finish stuff or figure things out. Um, so yeah, that, I think, and the, the expectation that people will be available after that is really nice, since people are working different hours and have different, Availabilities being able to come in knowing if I'm working early, I know I'll get resolution around, you know, ours is 11 15, so around then, versus the feeling of am I going to be chasing the person I need potentially throughout the day. Um, so, again, I think that's a can be a stress reliever by having that shared expectation. Um, you know, we do weekly department meetings, um, always with video chat. Um, I know some people will do them by phone. We find the video chat is, um, you know, just very rich information. Um, there. Um, one thing, and I think a lot of people have this, and, and it's interesting thinking about it as a management process, because uh, I often think of it as a perk, but flexible hours. And right now, I mean, people going to the grocery store is an important, strategic, uh, sort of vital decision you're making on a daily and weekly basis. When can I go? When are they going to have groceries? When will they let me in, right? When can I reduce my exposure to people? And so, um, you know, the way we do that is mention we use Slack. The idea is, you know, when you're working, you're on Slack. So if you're going to have eight hours, um, but that might be spread out a lot. And so on our team, I think, and we've heard people articulate, really appreciating being able to say, taking the morning off because I need to, you know, deal with, you know, I need some sort of mental health time and I need to go get groceries. And then the sense that they might be working at night. Um, and we don't actively sort of audit, but if you ever needed to, the idea is you can always look back and say, okay, people work that time, they were putting it in, and Jody, what you were saying, that idea of the same amount of hours, it just might be spread out in very, uh, at least for our team, some people are keeping sort of a, you know, eight to four or nine to five. A lot of people are really breaking that up in different ways. And I think um, people who don't have experience with that, there can be, I think from a management side, a sense of, well, how do you know? And you know, clocking in and out can be annoying. And part of it is if you have deliverables, then that's really what matters. Um, but if you use something like Slack, the idea of people being online or saying they're he, you know, in and out and being responsive is it's a pretty good proxy. And so for us, that works. I mean, knock on wood, I don't think we've ever had a problem. Um, it's sort of everyone self-regulates. Um, so that goes really well. Um, Jody, I know you had yeah. the um, process too that you'd mentioned before with the Pomodoro technique um, personally. Do you want to talk about that a bit? Sure. 
Um, one of the things that I picked up maybe six or six or eight months ago was something called the Pomodoro technique. And, and some of you may or may not be familiar with it, but um, essentially what you do is you break your work into different tasks that are 25 minutes long um, and you set a timer for 25 minutes and you give your undivided attention to that task. You don't allow yourself to be distracted. You work completely on that task. The timer goes off at 25 minutes and then you get up and get a drink of water or go to the restroom or something like that. And then you do that for, I think three cycles in a row and then you take a much larger break um, of like 20 or 30 minutes. Um, in my experience, I 25 minutes doesn't, it feels like I just sat down. So what I do is I've extended that to 45 minutes is kind of my ideal chunk of time. Um, I certainly don't let myself sit longer than like 90 minutes without getting up. Um, but I, I try to work uh, because there are so many distractions um, with my spouse at home and, and my kid at home. I think it's really important um, to overcome that feeling of needing to be available and present all of the time. Um, I have slack up when I'm working at my desk, um, but I'm not always available on it and that's okay. Um, and if I really don't want to be, um, the way we use, we, the way we use slack because we work across time zone is that it's not really, that we don't really have the expectation that somebody's going to answer immediately. Um, we, we definitely see the value in kind of just being able to drop things in and, and, and communicate asynchronously. Um, but, you know, I'll set a status that says something like heads down time or have a deadline or something like that. Um, and so I, I'm tr I try to be mindful and deliberate about times during the day when I cut off all distraction and I work in a really focused way. And one of the things that I found is that now that I have that that time in the morning for, for me at 7 to 8 30. Um, I'm, I'm a morning person. I'm more productive. My brain, when I wake up, my brain is on fire. It like immediately just starts working. It's the total opposite for my husband, which is good when you have a family. Um, but I've found that the combination of mapping my most productive time onto that time when I don't have any distractions and having that to do list with these are the top three things that you have to get done today has really allowed me in some ways to be more productive than I was before when I would allow myself to kind of come in and out and allow myself to get distracted with email or with something else because now it's like, you know, I have a very limited amount of time and I've got to deliver. Um, and so I'm not, I'm, I'm being more disciplined with myself about the way that I work. Um, and one thing, one other thing that I do want to say is that um, I know that there's a lot of anxiety and I've certainly had this anxiety myself about, well, I'm not going to be giving I'm not going to be giving the same um, to my employer. I'm not going to be able to deliver the same way to my team, or I'm going to let people down. And I, I just think that that's okay, and that we all, um, that we all understand that, and we all understand that we're working under completely different, compl and during a completely different time and under different circumstances. Whether you're single and by yourself, whether you have kids, whether you have older kids, whatever it might be. Um, I don't think we're meant to be as productive as we normally would. And so some days, um, you know, I, I can, the, the way I think about it is, um, the, you know, I put the deliverables first and if I'm able to deliver on what, um, what has been asked of me, that's most important, more so than the number of hours that I put in. And so um, I don't work an eight hour workday all the time. Tuesday, I was trying to get two deliverables out and I work, pro I, I worked probably eight or nine. Um, and then on Friday, you know, it's the end of the week and, um, my kid takes a nap at one o'clock and I'm planning on taking a nap at one o'clock with her, you know, like we just have to do what's best for us because I really, this is, it's not like we're doing this for two or three weeks, right? This is a bit of a marathon. We don't know how long we're doing this. So we have to come back to, um, you know, if I take care of myself first and my family first, I'm going to be able to give to my work um, in a more, in a more sustainable way. And so that's kind of the way that I, I like to think about it. Definitely the emphasis on it. It's a marathon, not a sprint. And I think that's such an important point, Jody, in, in terms of this unique time that we're all in. Um, and I am being conscious of our time right now. We've had such a wonderful discussion that I know we're getting a little bit uh, closer to end here. So I do want to give a chance to answer some of the questions that we've been getting from viewers. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and just open that up here. 
Um, so the first question, um, particular to this uh, teleworking situation, each day I deal with some level of guilt for being distracted by my kids' work or vice versa. Um, have you found any ways to manage this impossible balance of guilt, um, this impossible balance and the guilt that comes along with it rather? And I, I think Jody was kind of speaking to that um, a bit too before of, of really trying not to feel guilty, but um, does anybody have anything to add um, with this unique time right now? I'll, something I'll note, um, that I, I experienced that and I think especially the first week, uh, I had this sense where I was like, well, am I not doing a great job at work and not doing a great job with my kid? And that's, you know, terrible feeling. Um, and I mean, talking to friends about this who are in a similar position, part of it is, and I like what Jody said, is I mean, part's about expectations and trying to find a balance, uh, which is difficult. But what, what I've thought a lot about with um, my child has been um, making sure that kind of what, what he's forcing on me is that it's not half time all the time, but that it is dedicated time. But he also can't have dedicated time all the time. So, so uh, trying to follow his patterns where when he's getting imaginative and running around and we've just played, great time for me to get some work done, but also not, um, I think the first week I was trying to do a lot of, a little bit with him, a little bit and kind of bouncing. And again, the feedback I was getting from him was that that was not great for him. And, um, and we have very limited screen time, but I'm, you know, I sit next to him, he really enjoys that. And that's part of my productive time. It's great, you know, it's like when he's actually sitting. Um, so those are small, I mean, the guilt, part of it is I think Jody's hit the nail on the head. It's like, this is, this is not normal. This is gonna be difficult and realizing part of what I'm dealing with the guilt is adjusting and saying, I'm gonna look back and I'm like journaling about this. Like, I'm gonna look back and say, wow, I got to spend all this time with my kid. And it was hard because of everything going on. Um, but make sure to, I'm taking a lot of videos that right now I'm tired, but thinking in two years, I'm going to love watching those. Uh, right now I'm too exhausted to, but that's one of the things I do. Um, well, I, I think since we kind of touched on this a bit, I'll, I'll move on to the next question here to get in a few more. Um, so this is a little bit more specific. Good question. Um, can you discuss the family's first act for paid leave and considerations for how it affects your career? And I don't know if anybody here, if we're not comfortable with that, I think also maybe we can maybe link out to um, resources too specific to that. But um, does anybody have any thoughts on that um, particular act? Well, that's what my husband home is on. It, it, my home is on, is home on. Um, so I'd be happy to share with you the link that I have um, that links out to that. There's basically five different points, I believe, that you have to qualify for. Um, one would be if you have an underlying health issue. And for us, um, he, had, he had two people at his work go out for that. So he's a warehouse manager and he supplies the plumber. Um, and the plumbers were still coming in for jacuzzi tubs. And that is not essential. So therefore, you know, he felt like he needed to take a step back to take care of our children because I do have to work from home because I still, you know, this is really not a whole lot different for me except for all them. So he came home to support them. So that's another reason that you can stay home. Two weeks of your sick time, I think, is paid out first and then subsequent reductions after that. But I can put the link in for you after. Yeah, and that's, um, you know, I was thinking earlier, I mean, I, I'm, I'm in a privileged position in the company where, well, we can all flex our time, um, but as CEO, someone's probably not going to, you know, critique my time, my, my usage of that. Um, but I try and model by getting those hours within a, something that gives me a healthy work-life balance. But the way I think about this act, because I'm thinking about it for myself and employees, is, um, is yeah, there is a point where I think for different people, depending on their home situation, if someone gets, I think, I'm thinking a lot about it, especially as people are going to get sick and people are taking care of them, making sure to communicate that this is a perfectly sort of reasonable um, and while well, you're entitled to it, so it's literally a reasonable entitlement to use that for everyone's career. And I've articulated that that's something I will consider, um, especially you know, if someone gets sick, but even right now, I mean, the government's also helping companies by doing some level of reimbursement for that. So it's, it is something that people financially, you know, companies should be uh, sort of, responsible to and, and I think that um, I'm gonna I gotta do more looking into it but especially if this gets extended into May I'm probably gonna take probably just a couple of weeks because this is you know it's very difficult and as things pick up my wife's gonna be actually less and less available and so um, so I guess I'm the answer I think for me is it's a viable 
part of my career and in my role, I think about, I need to be articulate about modeling that so other people understand that it is for them as well. Sure, and I, I know we're um, right about at time here. Um, do we have time for one more question? Maybe one last audience question. I think this might be kind of a quick one too. Um, a couple of people asking something similar to, um, if you don't um, have kind of in-person uh, communication tools set up, um, what's advice for managing projects without having those? I'm, I'm thinking probably to Brian's point earlier that it's important to kind of start getting those set up now. Um, does anybody have kind of any last thoughts on, on that in terms of live communication? I would say it's 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 what you're comfortable with, really. Um, like I said, I use pretty basic Skype, and we use we use Google, we use Google Hangouts, and things of that nature. But you really need to tailor it to your circumstance, however your folks are most comfortable. Um, and that might just be enhancing your presence online. Update your LinkedIn profile. Um, jump on the ISMTE listserv start talking with other people, um, start reaching out because I think it's about your own personal motivation in order to make these things happen versus the tools that you use. Um, I'm forcing myself constantly to be on video now, um, just like we talked about. So however, however it works best for you in order to get your work done, um, but we definitely, we definitely started out with Skype and we're still using it, so it's still working for us. Um, so if, if you wanna try Zoom or you wanna try House Party, um, you could try those different things, um, or there's been a, a multitude of great suggestions here today. And I, I would encourage you to focus on s small meetings, so one, one other person, so groups of two, or maybe three or four. I find that those, they're even just, I mean, the size of people's faces are large enough that you, you're getting some of that interpersonal uh, information, and I think for a lot of people, that's rich. Um, the idea of having 10 people around a conference table that I think that is, is sort of the, the analogy online is fails even further. Um, you know, I think one person, I think we all experience this is actually pretty good. And so that's part of what I mean, I know it's a balance, but if you're used to a 10 person meeting, um, I do think those being presentations or informational is good, but doing pre briefs or post briefs with specific people or small groups, I think can be a really good way to, um, mm -hmm to get some of that other information or follow up or check in that you need. So I don't know if that's helpful. Definitely, you know, and I think too, we did talk about a lot of great tools here. Um, I do wanna say, because we don't have time, I'm not gonna show them, but we did prepare a couple of slides with links to references for some of the different working techniques we talked about, like Pomodoro, as well as different tools like Slack and Google um, Suite. So we will make those available to you all in a Zoom follow-up email, and then also everything will be publicly available after this webinar. We just have to get it loaded, but once it's up on YouTube, that will be available for anybody who wants to access it. Um, so with that, I want to thank everybody again for joining us today. Thank you to our guest speakers. We really do hope that you've come away with some useful tips from this webinar. Um, I will take a look at the questions we didn't get to answer and we can um, tweet out or share some answers to those questions in different ways. I'm sure we can figure out a, a virtual way to answer you all here. Um, so yes, thank you all again. And we hope that everybody is staying safe and well, that you and your families are well, and we hope you have a great rest of the day. All right, thanks everybody. Bye-bye. Yeah,